Hello and welcome to Trad Jazz Today. Dan Zeilinger has been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of his most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at the Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. Dan has met many people during his career and has spent many hours on and off stage with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. They all have stories worthy of a movie script, and through these interviews, Dan will be sharing them with you. Now, Dan Zeilinger. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. My next guest is somebody who holds a very special place in my heart, uh, mainly because, uh, well, we'll get into it as soon as I get done introducing him here. Here he is, Mr. David Gannett. Or well, David. hello, Dan. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Now, uh, I'm sure you remember when I first met you um, was at, I believe it was Sacramento, and uh, you had come off stage, I introduced myself, and uh, you made it a point to come hear me at one of my sets, and then you called me and, and to interview me for, for an interview for uh, the West Coast Rag. Yeah, that was a long time ago. And, and you wrote, you ended up printing my entire phone conversation with you, which shocked the hell out of me. And, and, and we had like a, a, a page and a half of Dan Zeilinger all of a sudden in the West Coast drag. And uh, it didn't mean a lot to me as far as getting jobs, but it, gave, it let me know that I was doing something right. So thank you. Well, you've always been doing something right. I've always appreciated your musicianship and your approach, in particular, bringing your trumpet chops to the tuba and the facility uh, that you brought to that, which was very different from what the majority of the tuba players were doing. So, uh, yeah, that was real estate on West Coast Rag that you needed to own. Well, well, thank you so much. It was like a lot of us showbiz guys. Um, there's actually a little boy inside going, is that good enough, Dad? You know, and, and, and I mean, maybe getting a little too personal here, but I think a lot of us have an inferiority complex and we make up for it by being verbose. And uh, your your article was uh, was confirmation that the people enjoyed what I did, and it meant a lot to me, sir. Well, I, I'm glad that it clicked, and uh, it meant a lot to me too, because I got to know you better, and I got to know some of my colleagues a lot better. And uh, I realized what cool people are out there playing music. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand how much a, a cheese in the breeze situation it is to just play music, to improvise. Uh, for me, I have to tell you, I spent years, if not decades, being horribly embarrassed by what I did. Uh, because, and, I'm, and that's not an attempt to be falsely uh, modest or anything like that. I understand. Uh, but I came from a classical background. And uh, I'll tell you a real quick story. Sure. I was <clears throat> attending school at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. I was studying with Harvey Phillips. I was his only student. And I was uh, also touring and doing clinics with him. And uh, I was playing and recording with a, and touring with the Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops. And uh, I could do pretty much anything you put in front of me musically. But I went down to your father's mustache in the combat zone one night. <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, you know how egotistical you are when you're young. I'm like, I'm going to show these clam diggers something. And uh, so they invited me up on the stage. And that big old banjo player, Bob Vanasek, who many will remember, uh, was size 18 feet. Um, he said, you are my sunshine in F. And we started to play. And Dan, I couldn't play it. I didn't know Jack. And, it, and I suddenly realized I can play music, but I can't make it. And that took every bit of wind out of my sails. And I said, I, I just have to be able to do this. And uh, so that kind of launched me on my quest of lots and lots of embarrassment for a long, long time. <laughs> but it's been worth it. You know, I get to meet such such cool people and have so much fun with my friends. And uh, well, you've get, had you've had a hell of a ride, sir. I mean, uh, oh, been lucky. Well, yeah, you know, I think the same way about my own career. Um, and I think if, if you're either trying to make a living at it, you almost have to be, you know, one with a river type of attitude 
uh, you sort of go where people want to hear you. But you know, if, uh, you went from that. You went to Rosie's. You played at Rosie's for quite a while, didn't you? Yes, I uh, went to the movie shortly after uh, Gene Paulson opened it. Uh, it was a Reedy Creek jazz band that Bill already had put together that he put in to Rosie O'Grady's. And uh, Gene Paulson, a scant two or three months, not even two months after they opened, his wife said they missed the Midwest. And uh, so like a good husband, he packed up and they moved back to Minnesota. And Bill called me. I was working in Mexico uh, at the time in the, uh, in the orchestra down there. And uh, so I made that long drive over to Orlando. So I joined Rosie's about two months after it opened its door. And I stayed with it in one form or another for the next 14 years or so. Yeah. By the way, I've also interviewed Jim Mayhack. Oh, yeah. What a character. So, so you know, I mean, all you guys came out of that, that Orlando. Incredibly musicians came out of Orlando. And once went through Rosie's, of course, went through Disney World. Um, yeah. Just unbelievable, unbelievable names. Uh, what a breeding ground for talent. Of course, the dogs came out of Orlando. They sure did. And, uh, you know, you brought up something which I think is uh, uh, very observant, is that uh, back in that day, and indeed for the next 20, 25 years, Orlando was an absolute hotbed of gigs and musicians. All the top musicians from around, uh, not all of them, but a good portion of them came down to Orlando because there was constant work. There was uh, Disney World and Sea World and later Universal and of course Disney and all its parks and all its, its extensions, plus the hotel work, plus recording, plus it was insanely busy. And what amazed me at the time, you know, when we got together in the Black Dogs, well, we knew we had a good band. You know, we were all like the first call guys at Disney and, and we knew what we had to do. It was an insane but, band. <laughs> but, you know, Dan, the truth be told, you could have at the time put together 12 bands at least as good as the Black Dogs from the musician pool in, uh, in Orlando. And by that, I mean people who not only knew the genre and could play the fire out of their horns, but they understood shtick. Well, see, and that was when I first time I saw the dogs, I was playing with Miss Behaven. Yeah. And I was, I was down at the, I was actually kind of gazing up, I probably Firehouse Lot or one of those places. And I looked over to Brian Shaw. I said, that's what we should be doing. The Misbehaven Jazz Band. With a name like Misbehaven and and the guys. I mean, you guys were rock stars. Uh, uh, you know, relatively speaking. Well, we were, we were trad uh, at the top of the trad heap for a while. and uh, uh, But it was interesting to see the... Uh, but you said shtick. And, and yeah. having the knowledge of how to present a show was the real key to the Black Dogs. I remember early on, Dan, when at Rosie O'Grady's, we had we went through several Red Hot Mamas, but we had one, uh, Jerry Rose. And not only was she devastatingly beautiful and curvaceous and everything a naughty hot mama ought to look like and be, uh, she's a great entertainer and had great outfits, great wardrobe. And uh, uh, we were off stage one time getting a drink. And I said, you know, Jer, <sighs> People love you, man. They, they just absolutely eat up what you do. And she she leaned over and and because it's noisy in the club and put her put her lips next to my ear. Oh, I'm getting shivers all over. And uh, she said, well, you know, honey, people listen with their eyes. And that struck home with me. It's like, oh, oh, yeah. And, you know, it was pretty much very shortly after that that I began trying to work out how to explode myself. Well, and, uh, I think you accomplished that, unfortunately. <laughs> it took me, you know, it took me about three years to figure it out because I don't know that anybody had done it before. Maybe they had, but I wasn't aware of it. And uh, it took me quite a while to put together everything to where I could explode on cue. And, uh, and it was funny because one day I was working at Disney, I was freshly married, and I found myself in my living room on my knees drilling a hole through my concert tuba to run the wiring for fireworks. And I, I hesitated for a moment. I thought, you know, I think I'm turning a corner here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, from that point on, it was pretty much shameless. And uh, as the years wore on and as I got progressively worn out and didn't play as well, as long as I blew up, people <laughs> would say, man, that guy was great. Did you, did you see him blow? And I could play like a dog. 
And as, if I blew up, people thought, that guy's, that guy's wonderful. You know, so. you know there's, a, there's a guy out here on the West Coast. Uh, you might even know David Silverman. He's one of the producers for The Simpsons. Oh, really? Cool. And he hooks up, a, 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 I think it's natural gas to, to a sousaphone bell. And he goes on the, and he does a, a Burning Man every year. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and and uh, no, I think I think you got to be a little bit off kilter there, son. To, yeah, yeah, I've been know. told that. Now yeah. l- let's go back for a minute. I want to talk about your your days in elementary school and in high school. Now, did you start as a tuba player? No, I was. Uh, I grew up in a musical family. I had three older sisters who were incredible virtuosos who went on to make their big big marks in the music world and uh since they were string players i started out on cello and uh and given the environment and the instruction and all that stuff i was what some might consider a prodigy on the uh, cello and uh, I, I don't say that to pat myself on the back but i was you know i had a good environment and i, I was it, it was hard not to be in those surroundings i imagine it, exactly so and uh but you know, I would go, <clears throat> I got into the youth symphony at a very early age and uh, was usually either sitting first or second chair. And I was directly underneath the conductor. And it was really stressful because he could hear everything you were doing and there was no room to hide. And I, Dan, I'd look over my shoulder and I'd see all the low brass players back there with their feet up and laughing and talking to each other. And I thought, man, I need to be back there. Are you kidding? And uh, long about high uh, junior high, when I was uh, <clears throat> about 15, the band director came to me and said, hey, I need a tuba player for a concert. Would you learn a few notes? And so I picked up the tuba and, and that was it. I was like, man, that's all I want to do. I don't want to play cello. I want to play tuba. And uh, so I just took it from there and just transferred all my cello knowledge over to tuba. And naturally enough, I became a classical player right off. Well, you know, uh, one of the one of our dirty little secrets as tuba players uh, that we don't like to tell everybody is is you really have all the power. You oh, yeah. you can make the rest of the ensemble, regardless of how big or how small, sound foolish if if you decide to, or or to sound wonderful. <clears throat> and and there's yeah. something about that. I I I'm, I happen to be an A type myself, and I like that control. You know, I would be the catcher on a baseball team type of thing. Um, and and. Uh, once you once you get a bug for that, because as you know, I went from being a lead trumpet player. I was a high note guy, and and uh, and when I found tuba, it was like, no, this is where it is. This is, you know, I can I can People wrap those trumpet that. players around my finger. People don't understand that because you can you can set the mood in the band, you can set the drive, you can set the feel, you can set uh, just about anything you want in the band, especially if you're working with a good drummer, which are rare. Oh, uh, but yep. you know, I, I was tickled because I left Rosie's for several years, and, and you know when I was I went on the road with Ringling, and uh, but I would I would feed lines, uh, musical lines to the band, and they'd pick up on them and incorporate them into the various head arrangements, and then I was constantly Bill Bill Allred was a wonderful comedic talent, a very just a mercurial mind. And he loved puns, as do I. And so I'd be feeding him lines, uh, sotto voce, uh, on the show. I'd think of something and I'd say it to him. And he'd, he'd do it on the mic and I'd get a laugh and go, oh, okay, that goes in the routine. Well, I say all that to say this. That when I left <clears throat> for several years, and then I came back and uh, went down to Rosie's to sub my first night back. And all the arrangements, all the patter, everything they were doing was stuff I'd done, the stuff that I'd fed to the band. And I said, you know, nobody n- really knows this except me, but it is, uh, it is pleasing. <laughs> oh, it, it, well, it's, it's funny that you, you mentioned that, uh, in my, there's nothing like feeding lines to the guy on the microphone and have him spell them without saying, without thinking what he's doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. you can really set up people for some uh, interesting moments. Uh, I was fortunate enough in in my later uh, days to be in a band with Westy Westerhofer. Oh man, what a great man! And he what was a... playing trombone and, and euphonium, when I was playing tuba. But he would be he would be on the mic, and I could just feed him stuff night and day, and we go right over the air, you know. 
Yeah. Can I tell you a quick story about Weston? Please do. And, and I'm going to try to do it without choking up. Um, I was, uh, I had moved out to Hollywood. I was working with a group called the Don Ellis Band. I and, remember. Uh, yeah, what, what, and, what year was that? That would have been 73. I then I saw you because I was going to Orange Coast College at the time. Okay. Okay. So when Don Ellis did that concert, I was in the audience. Oh my gosh. What a small world, huh? But uh, that was a dream come true for me because I, I didn't think I'd ever make it to Hollywood or, or particularly the Don Ellis band for years and, and things just worked out. So uh, I was uh, out in Hollywood. We've been doing gigs. We've been traveling around doing local appearances and stuff. And then just about the end of November, Don canceled all the band gigs until next summer to go over to uh, London for Warner Brothers to score French Connection 2, which the band recorded the soundtrack for. And uh, so there were no gigs. Man, there was nothing. And all the holiday recording had been done. All the stuff they do for the holidays is done, usually September or you know, October at the latest. And so I'm sitting there high and dry, no work. And I'm a new guy in town. Nobody's hiring me for anything. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I did a lot of practicing, but I was really coming up on hard times. And I was uh, literally starving. I was literally down to, you know, buying a box of Bisquick and living on that for a week and a half. Uh, and I happened to run into West. He said, well, come on down and visit sometime. You know, I said, well, sure. And so I went down and visited Westy and his wife. And, and uh, they were, of course, incredibly gracious. And uh, we played duets and we talked and we did all kinds of things. And uh, I was getting ready to leave. And Westy said, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, and he talked to his wife. And uh, he came out of the kitchen with a, a bag overflowing with groceries. And I was stunned because, you know, the old saying back then, never let them see you sweat. I wasn't complaining about my situation. I wasn't letting on. I wasn't had a long, I didn't have a long face, but somehow he picked up on it and he responded by giving me enough food to get through like most of the month. And that, that did the trick. That's what actually saved me. And I was forever grateful to him because that besides his great uh, musicianship on so many instruments, and his incredible entertainer, <laughs> what, an, what an entertainer. Uh, he had a gigantic heart, one of the kindest people I've ever met. So, yeah. so when he left us, that was, that was tough. Yeah, was, he and I ended up being very good friends. I, I'm still in contact with Sharon and the boys. Oh, um, wonderful. To this day. And, uh, and uh, I actually, I plan on putting together kind of a Zoom call for everybody to relate their stories with, with Sharon and the boys. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'll let you know when that happens, if, if you'd like to be in on that. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm sure there, you won't have room on the screen or enough time for all the stories uh, that it, about Westy. It's true. It's true. And I have, you know, a week's worth myself. <laughs> but no, a, a wonderful guy. In fact, uh, he and I had lunch the Wednesday before he passed. Uh, uh, he decided he was going to have a pastrami sandwich. And uh, just kind of, that's just kind of Westy, you know. Yeah, what was? Do you mind telling me what he passed away from? I never did. It was complications yeah. having to do. He had an enlarged heart. Yeah. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. and he had some of the best treatment available, but uh, you know, saying was he had a large heart isn't anything new. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, yeah. you know, but it, but it was literally true, also. Yeah, unfortunately, but uh, I think one of my regrets is that I wasn't able to spend more time in California and uh break into the i'm California. glad you didn't <laughs> well there's so many good play dan you know how the players that are out there come on i mean uh there's something else and and actually when i when i left uh the ellis band i'd i'd been called three times to join the orquesta sinfonica de la salvo de mexico uh which was the state orchestra of mexico we were the envoys for the president of mexico and they called me three times to come down and play and uh, they called again, and I said, you know, things aren't really happening here in, in L.A., uh, and I need money. I need to work. And so I, I headed on down to Mexico, and Jim Self took over for me 
yeah. in the uh, in the Ellis Band, and of course he became the dude out there uh, for everything recording. Yep, I had no, I haven't talked to Jim. Um, in fact, I don't know him, um, but uh, everybody tells me that I should meet him. He's quite a character. He's a fellow pilot, and uh, he's uh, a, a truly unique soul. He really is. He's worth knowing. Well, I'll take your recommendation and run with it. Now, I want to talk to you something about, I want to go back several years from where we are right now. Okay. And, and ask you how you got into improvisation from a classical background. Well, uh, first of all, it was painfully difficult, but I had three uh, big inspirations for that. And that, first of all, I studied with Bill Bell, who many tuba players know was legendary principal of the Sousa band and New York Phil. And by the way, uh, I've spoken with, e I've, I've spoken with Eli also. Okay. Okay. So, and he mentions Bill Bell. Bingo. And uh, he said, uh, he said, play the music and uh, you know, learn the horn, play the music. And he taught me all the basics of that. Then when I went to study with Harvey Phillips, he, uh, he said, learn the melodies. If you want to play jazz, play the melody so that it swings. And, and he came and sat in with us once in, in um, Mesa when I was working there and swung his butt off on the pennies from heaven, just blew everybody away. And he couldn't really improvise, but he, he, he'd present things like they were the, you know, gold from Olympus. And uh, then my third influence was Rich Madison, uh, who told me, make it swing. Just make it swing. Whatever you do, play one note, but make it swing. And uh, that had a profound impact on me. I know the first time I heard Louis and, uh, yeah, Louis and the Dukes uh, recording with Rich Madison playing Helicon on that. And that lit a fire under me because I, I heard that and I said, that, that is how you play the tuba. That's how it, 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 It's interesting that you bring, bring up Rich. I spent... I spent a, a semester at North Texas no kidding. Uh, on, on a study program and had a uh -huh. chance to be in his improv class. Um, and what's, what I find fascinating is when people ask me, when, when players ask me two albums they should get when it comes to jazz, I mm -hmm. tell them the tuba consortium mm -hmm. and, and tubas from hell. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, you flatter me. Thank you very much. The, uh, I had the great opportunity to, uh, uh, to play with the two uh, Madison Phillips, uh, Phillips Madison tuba consort uh, shortly after Rich died. And we were doing a tribute to him at the uh, Jazz Educators Conference in Boston. And uh, that, was, that was a thrill for me. I'm no damn Parentoni, but uh, my gosh, that band, you know, with, with uh, uh, of course, with Harvey and, and uh, oh, I'm having a senior on the drummer, the famous drummer, uh, Belson, Louis Belson. Uh, on drums and uh, he has such a great band and it, it was so much fun to play with him but yeah rich rich i i'm not really sure that i've ever heard any play buddy play jazz on tuba like he did and make it happen um, i had subsequent uh, many summers of opportunity of informal study with him when he'd come as a guest artist for the college program at disney and uh, for various other other things and uh, we got to know each other fairly well and he did invite me to be his uh, uh teaching assistant when he took the position in jacksonville and i just gotten married and bought a house and i couldn't take it and i still that's one of those would have could have should have things i was like oh man that would have been the experience of a lifetime but eh, you know how it goes anyway we survive we keep moving on and uh <clears throat> you know the orlando scene was uh well let's go back to the black dogs for a minute Sure. I have to say that was, I think that's the most fun I've ever had was playing with that band off and on for 20, 25 years. Uh, we were all good friends. We were all just sick puppies. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, it was the, the humor on stage, the psychotic humor on stage that the audience couldn't hear was devastating. There were many a time where we, we could barely play because we were choking with laughter. Each one of those guys was a comedic genius, and uh, any one of them could take the show all by themselves and do it and make it happen. 
So it was just nothing but fun. And this may jog a memory for you. I don't know. We were over in Germany, Dan, and uh, I ran across stink bombs made in Germany, which were uh, little sealed glass ampules of, is it hydrogen sulfide? Is that yeah, the right like farts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, now, if you knew that was, if you broke one and you knew it was a chemical, you could handle it. But if you didn't and you thought it was biological, it would turn your stomach. It was just the absolutely most horrible thing. And so we got in the habit. Uh, we would determine who got to be the break boy. And, you know, when they have the cluster at the end of every festival and every band gets up there and plays Big Bear Stomp. Well, our thing was that on the downbeat of the out chorus of Big Bear Stomp, one of us would drop a capsule and stomp it. And that smell would gradually spread across the state. And the guys in the other bands would turn around, look at us, go, oh my gosh, those dogs are sick. And gradually there'd be this space that would clear <laughs> out until the dogs were all alone in the center stage playing. <laughs> and we did that for, for years, I think. It was uh, just something fun to do. Well, all I knew is, is when I went to see the dogs play, that is, if there was any attractive woman under the age of 30, they were around that stage. And uh, that was good enough for me. Well, we attended to appeal to a, a younger generation, which was helpful for uh, ticket sales and badge sales. Oh, as yeah. You well, no, you go to a festival and they're looking at their bottom line, you know, the, to fly a band in, unless they're local, it's going to cost them 10 grand or better for, for uh, you know, transportation ground and air hotels damage uh, repair <laughs> damage repair yeah parole officer alerts those type of thing and uh we consistently because we attracted a younger crowd we would make the uh festivals more money than they spent on us and they loved it of course at the end of the festival you have to pay back your vigorish uh your fee for the privilege of appearing and they made mounting on us hand over fist for many, many years. And so we had no problem. I booked the band for a couple of years and we were booking, I don't know, 35, 40 festivals a year uh, here and overseas. And we had no problem getting our foot in the door, you know, because yeah. they knew we would sell product for them. And uh, our concession sale, you know, the years that I spent on Ringling Circus <clears throat> was an important lesson for me because I realized that the money was in the concession sales. Right. That's where the money is. <clears throat> so uh, we came up with all kinds of concessions, like T-shirts and little things. And uh, we typically ran about a 12 to 13 percent of uh, headcount for each venue on sales, which is obscenely high because uh, we were able to uh, inspire that impulse purchasing. And uh, I remember one time, uh, yo, rest his soul. Uh, I came up with the idea because everyone was marching around and waving those Mardi Gras hankies. You know, they waved their napkins and stuff. Well, let's make a Mardi Gras napkin and put our logo on it and put paw prints all over it. And, oh, they poo-pooed that. <clears throat> and Yoke especially said, ah, that's stupid. And I said, all right. So I made them myself. I made a gross of them. And uh, we sold out, I think, in the first two sets. And uh, and they were didn't cost anything to produce. And I think we charged five bucks a piece for them. So I went went home with a couple grand <laughs> in my pocket or, you know, quite a chunk of change. And they, they were all just a little bit, uh, you know, set back. It's like, oh, oh, OK, maybe we should look more into merchandising. But, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I really ought to consult you because I've, I've been toying with the idea of merch for my for my YouTube channel. But, yeah, uh, I haven't. Well, you got I, a great logo, man. You should you should well, thank uh, you should do that. <laughs> Put that on a T-shirt. And yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm also thinking about what would uh, what would directly appeal to the demographic, but uh, oh. that's the problem, isn't it? Because our demographic is dying. Um, as you perhaps know, I was in a, a serious industrial accident in 2003 and knocked out uh, 12 of my teeth and crushed my upper palate, and uh, and went through a bunch of surgeries uh, subsequent to that. And that's part of the reason I grew the beard. I, I'm not scarred up that much, but uh, I, as a tuba player, I could never play tuba with a mustache. I know some guys that can, but I can't. Oh, yeah, I tried for a while. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. I needed that hermetic seal. But, uh, and I tried, uh, I tried, I, 
Dan, I spent uh, two years playing long tones and it was almost a year before I ever got a sound out of the instrument. I'd, I'd put my mouth on the mouthpiece and it'd just be air. I couldn't get my lips to vibrate. And, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not saying, wham, wham, poor Dave. I'm just no, saying, I, by the way, Dave, process. just to, just as a point of interest, I'm completely dentured. Okay, really? Are you, and you have no problem playing? I didn't say that. <laughs> I, uh, I, things ain't what they used to be, but I still, I still work. Uh, well, God bless you. I, uh, I spent years playing thousands of hours of long tones, which is incredibly b boring, as you know. And I eventually, by the time I got to about 2007, I could play after a fashion. And uh, Davy Jones called me to do a, a recording uh, solo album that he wanted to do. I think it was called uh, Down the Road or, or something like that. And, uh, you know, I was just real unhappy with it. I just, I never got it. I wanted the story to be, hey, Dave's back and he's better than ever. And it just never made it. I was Dave's back and he's 70%. And uh, so I, you know, after that, I thought, you know, maybe I don't really need to be doing this. And uh, I kept at it. I kept playing gigs and, and festivals. I was booking festivals with my own band and uh, which was, a it was, it's so hard to play in another band after you've played in the black dogs. Cause that's like trying to explain color to a blind man. You tell people swing or you tell people entertain the people, do some shtick, you know, respond to my lead. I'm, I'm giving you oh, setups. Do it's something. a very special group of people that <laughs> understand everything. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, anyway, we got to around 2012, and I had booked the band in the uh, uh, Clearwater Jazz Fest. And we went down there, and it was odd because we were very well received. We got standing ovations at nearly every uh, venue. But I had a lot of problems playing. I just barely got through it. And then about two weeks after that, the dogs went over to uh, Breda Holland for the Breda Fest. And so, uh, of course, I went along and, and Dan, I mean, I would have to get better to suck. That's, that's how, how badly it was. I just, I, I really didn't survive that festival. It was horrible and it was, it was humiliating. And I didn't, I didn't want to be that guy who played too long or didn't retire soon enough. And so I came home from that festival and I sold my instruments. I remember, now, I remember seeing that ad all of a sudden yeah. and thinking to myself, uh, uh-oh. Because uh, when I saw that black sousaphone come up, that, that horn come up, I just thought to myself, oh, something's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what a wonderful instrument that was. A Busher 19, 18, uh, 1917 Busher B-flat. Uh, yeah, and uh, what a nice horn. Uh, and, you know, truth be told, like any other time when you're going through another door, uh, it took me a little while to reconcile that because that's that was my prime identity all my life from the age of 15 until 2013. And uh, uh, but I got over it. I'm fine. And uh, I've moved ahead into other areas and uh, able to do uh, find an outlet for my creative urges. Uh, nowadays, I'm an exo archaeologist. And I've, uh, I've seen the shows. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> you know what that's about, but uh, it's not, not for everybody, but uh, it does keep me very, very much engaged with some very interesting work. And it's a lot of creative putting together the videos, as you know, from doing yours, but uh, well, it's been a terrific ride. I've had such, such, such fun and, and more than any one person deserves. And, get to play with people like Bill Allred and Jim Mayhack and Eddie Metz. And, you know, how, how can you complain about something like that? I, I know. I know. I, I fortunately, I tell people for my career that I was insanely spoiled uh, coming up into this style of music. And, and I think I hear a lot of that coming from you also. You, when I, when I realized that everybody in the world didn't play like Howard Alden or Brad Roth, uh, and, that's, a, and, that's a wake up and that was and that was my first two banjo players i played with uh, mm -hmm. in the style and That'll brian be. shaw and trumpet and and all of a sudden i get into the to the real dixieland world and think oh my gosh yeah. you know yeah. was i i was just spoiled rotten um 
Well, that's the thing. Uh, we were surprised when we went out the first time. Well, the first time we went out was the Bix Festival in 88, I think. And we hadn't gone anywhere. This was our first thing. We drove 24 hours to get to it. And nobody knew who we were. And we kind of exploded on the scene there, just locally. And um, our concert, our live concert that Saturday night, which was the big deal, we, they gave us prime time. And we had about 10,000 people in the audience and they went ballistic. And we thought, huh, well, by golly, they seem to like this. And so shortly after, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but we went up and did the uh, Terev Vic uh, Jazz Festival in Victoria. Yeah. DC. And that was really our breakup. That's that's where people kind of plastered against the walls and get, oh my gosh, what's what is this? And um, and from that point, it, we just went into fast forward and 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 rolled from there. But uh, you're right. You get out on the circuit, and you hear all these bands that obviously are weekend bands. Nothing nothing detracting from them. God bless them for doing what they're doing. Uh, but the level of performance and professionalism sometimes was maybe not what one could hope for yeah and uh it's it's hard it's hard to know yeah to put everything in perspective we would play uh we would play a set and people would come up and say oh my gosh this is the best thing we've ever heard you guys are incredible you're unbelievable <clears throat> and then we'd be going by uh, a set by uh professor name of a fruit follows and yes, uh, i know them and i mean no disrespect to them but they they would play their set and people come up and say oh my gosh this is the best band i've ever heard you guys are unbelievable you know i would, i realize there's basically no discrimination in well, the secular audience so to speak yeah my version <laughs> of that story is is quite often fans would come up and say you know you guys are my favorite band you and and then they would name the band <laughs> that i liked the least yeah yeah yeah, like a, a rusty weekend, uh, you know, one of those bands. It's a uh, oh gosh, but uh, but oh the fun, man! The green room and the uh, I was you know uh, part of it is. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Part of it is is that is you guys brought uh, Disneyland entertainment value to an adult audience. The, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Around, we weren't playing. We weren't playing for kids. Exactly, but you knew the. But you know, the showbiz side of one thing Disney does well is teach presentation and 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 uh, and they know to dress up Dixieland bands in pastel colors. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Lots of but I came I came out of the, of course, the West Coast, uh, uh, Knott's Berry Farm and those kind of things. By the way, I spent some time in uh, Circus Europa Rama in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, so cool. I've, I've done that circus gig, too. And, and boy, that's a slaughterhouse. For chops. Oh man, you, you know. got it, you got it. It's uh, we were uh, we were one of the things that I think set us apart was tempos and dynamics. Uh, we slowed everything down until it was a bump and a grind to where people had to get up and dance. I think and, the thing that set you apart was testosterone. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I had some, but. Uh, you know that for us, <laughs> for us it was uh, it was tempo and dynamics. You know, most of the bands you listen to just play loud all the time, no matter what, and that really is acoustically boring. And uh, and we could break down into small groups and do different things. You know, during a tune, and there was a lot of flexibility to the the band. And we learned to read each other. Of course, we played just like you did, Dan. We played thousands of hours with each other off the stand at Disney and Orlando and Rosie's and SeaWorld and all the places. And we knew each other like the back of our hands. And so the communication, the psychic communication on, on stage was uh, pretty remarkable. And so we could accommodate each other within a microsecond if things were going to take a left turn. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, it's hard to find a group like that. I think well, absolutely would, to where you you have that kind of attunement with each other. It's uh, I'd experienced it. Uh, you know, I worked in a couple of different professional group, brass quintets where that communication was evident. But then you have them all right in front of you. You know, it's not you're not spread out across the stage. And 
and different classical groups and things that uh, kind of had that going. But uh, for a traditional jazz band, mm -mm. and uh, we we decided early on to do the '30s shtick with wardrobe to dress the you know floppy hats, suspenders, shirts, you know pleated pants, and uh, it beats uh, red vests and white pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we just wanted to emulate the 30s. We wanted to be down and dirty and nasty and bump and grind and drink too much bourbon. And, uh, you know, this is maybe how it was like back in the day. We don't know for sure, but we tried to recreate that. And I think it's been mildly gratifying over the years to see the impact the dogs had on on the uh, genre. You know, we hear the, uh, the Bo Diddley beat and we see people dressing like us and you know, different things like that. And stealing arrangements, which is fine. That's how we do. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you kind of left a thumbprint anyway when you see stuff like that. Oh, no, big, big influence uh, on the circuit. It, it, and it's interesting when you talk to uh, the traditionalists who, who really don't know what they're talking about, to be honest. Who, who get upset as yeah, scientists who are jazz scientists exactly exactly um one of the things one of the topics that comes up over and over and over on this show is uh the fact that uh definitions you know what is new orleans what is chicago what's kansas city what is uh it most of those definitions are scholastics musicians are just trying to make a buck well, that's the thing. It's it's the old thing. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? It gets down to the this very mental, intellectual, super picky, fussy thing that has nothing to do with, in this analogy, religion, or in our analogy, music. It's about the music. It's always been about the music. Can you make people dance? Can you entertain people and make them happy? Well, can actually, make, that's a, that's a big sentence right there. Yeah, because there are a lot of bands out there, especially on the circuit, who don't understand that your job is to make people dance. Bingo. I, I would get so and that's what was so great about the dogs and Eddie Metz in particular, because he understood that. But, uh, for example, how many times have you gone out uh, at a festival and you hear uh, uh, Riverboat Shuffle, bop it with up, bop it with up, bop it, and they play it like an arm and exercise. That was a dance tune, man. You know, make it so play it at a tempo where they can dance. And uh, that one, uh, uh, the one and only album I did with my little local group, the Wolf Jokers in uh, Davenport, uh, we recorded at Danceland Ballroom, which was where Dix, uh, Bix used to play uh, with various bands. And he, he was there quite regularly just as an audience member, hoping to get asked to sit in. <clears throat> but it was an incredible state-of-the-art acoustic ballroom where the band was a band shell, an interior band shell with acoustic, you know, scallops at the top and all wood. And the sound was just amazing. And uh, I finally got the band to understand tempos a little bit when we started rehearsing there because they began to hear hear what the sound was and they could see this vast ballroom in front of them and the people might be dancing there and they started to understand it's like oh 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 let's we're a dance band let's make them dance but the uh, reminds me <laughs> it was a sacra i don't know if it was sacramento or nah it was what up what's the one high sierra with the high side three rivers three rivers sure, yeah. three rivers yeah yeah and uh, they asked us to do the dinner hour for the uh, uh, the heavy hitter sponsors. <laughs> and uh, we went, sure. And we came in. And of course, we were all, like I say, you know, Disney guys. And so we played dinner music. We played, you know, sambas and standards, all real low key and real smooth. And people were coming up and looking at us like, what's wrong with you guys <laughs> but you're eating right you don't want to th you know and uh, they were surprised that a band would do that i guess but uh you know it's about doing that that's one thing harvey told me uh, early on he said uh when you're doing re recording sessions it says you're not a rock musician you're not this kind of music that kind of, you're a musician 
So come in there, you'll be a chameleon, and you conform yourself to whatever that style is and make it happen authentically. But that's not where you stay. You come out and uh, it's kind of like uh, the old Star Trek with Odo the shapeshifter. You go in there, you assume your shape, and then you come back and fall into your bucket. So uh, in our case, it was a bucket of Jägermeister or Jim Beam. They used to put <clears throat> gallon bottles of it on the stage for us. <laughs> and we, we didn't hesitate to dive in. But uh, I was talking to somebody about, um, I was looking down on the stage. This is like within the last five years or so. And all of us had Diet Cokes. Uh, yeah. on, on stage and I said boy things changed things changed, boy, things changed. you know when we used to make little can holders for our stands for the beer <laughs> yeah you know that uh I don't know that the traditional jazz circuit will ever come back at least not in our lifetimes uh it's been brutally impacted just like everything else but then again but, I not don't... only by the not not only by the lockdown but but also by I guess for lack of a better term, political correctness. My biggest fear is this this style of music is going to be politically corrected out of existence. There you go. That's exactly right. Because so many of the uh, tunes were really out and out raunchy or racist. And uh, we would usually try to change some of the lyrics uh, to, to not be too offensive. But if you're going to do the real thing, it's 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 pretty raunchy stuff. I mean, there were a couple occasions. I don't know if you know the Fast Waller tune, Shave Me Dry. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, well, you know, the lyrics to that are, are <laughs> not for public consumption. But I remember we played it once or twice when we were late at night, really drunk with a really drunk audience and who didn't care. But but yeah, you're absolutely correct about that. The music is no longer politically correct. In fact, I've, I've actually talked to a couple of people who... who would like to take it the opposite direction and put together a, a band called the offensive jazz band <laughs> and do, uh, do, do me chong from Hong Kong. And when Tony goes over the top and, and uh, yeah, or if D war was fought with razors, that's what, that's the one, <laughs> you know, it, it does the, the, just to a band with, with every tune was a period uh, racist tune of some sort. Yeah. That was part of the history, you know, and, uh, I, Americans, I'm sorry, I, I, this is a soapbox I, I'm going to climb on. I don't really necessarily mean to, but but we are so egocentric in the United States yeah. that we don't realize the dungeons in London or the, the genocide that happened in every other country in the world. Yeah. And we have such a, so we have such a guilt complex about who we were and who we are. It's really misplaced. I agree. Uh you know, it's okay to be proud of your country. It's okay to be an American. Uh, we're not perfect. Neither is any other country. And uh, during the course of my career, like you, I've, I have uh, have had opportunity to travel a lot of different places. And it's always with a vast sigh of relief that we would return to America. And uh, in fact, when we, we were the first jazz band into uh, China. And uh, the running joke in the band while we were over there is we couldn't wait to get back to America to have good Chinese food. Cause it was. <laughs> I did a tour. I did a tour of the Yang I oh, understand. Yeah. Those, those poor folks, they will eat anything. And I mean, anything. I have a, a 3d image. We were playing at Tiger Hill and we came down and there was a lady, uh, you know how uh, a, a, a xylophone player, a marimba player will hold all their sticks between their fingers like right. that was she she had fried bats on a stick uh, <laughs> figured, and people were lined up buying them and i just thought ah, gosh maybe that's good but I, I think i'd have to be a little hungrier than i am right now yeah i understand yeah i had a i, I actually when i was the 10th avenue jazz band we did a tour of china good band and that, that was an eye-opener mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's really crowded over there and uh, I remember one one of the concerts, we came down the back stairs and there were these big tanks, uh, filthy tanks, you know, green with algae and uh, in which there were eels and carp and other things being prepared for the table. And I was like, oh, oh man, <laughs> they, uh, they had a thing over there. Maybe you ran into it when you were there. Uh, I forget what kind of chicken it's called at the moment, but they take a frozen chicken and they take a, a bandsaw to it, a crosscut saw, 
And so the meat is cut in slices, but it's full of these little bone splinters. And you take your life in your hands to, to eat any of it. The thing, I, the thing that I thought was really interesting is, is we were picked up from the airport <laughs> and uh, going down one of the main uh, freeway drags. I think this was, uh, it might have been Shanghai. Um, and there are uh, skyscrapers on each side of the highway. But the next street back, there was the butcher shops with the dogs hanging in the, yeah. and yeah, the front, the, the, if you just looked at it, the surface of what was presented to you, it looked very Western, looked very modern. And, and then uh, all of a sudden you'll see a house that has to dispose of their trash. They're just throwing it out the window. There's a pile of household trash right outside the, the house window. And, and this is 20, 30 years ago, mind you, but yeah, of uh, course. It, it's interesting, you know? Well, you know, it was funny because we uh, we had heard when we got to Beijing, uh, we had heard that a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken had opened on Tiananmen Square, and we didn't know how to get any transportation there. And it was it was quite a walk; it was miles. And of course, at the time, we all had long hair and beards, or growing beards, or whatever. It's hard to imagine how big that square is unless you've been there. Oh, it's huge! Anyway, we finally made it to. Uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and of course, the, the Chinese people where we go would point and talk and go, "Oh, I don't know, you know," and they, they they don't have fat people over there, or big people either, either way. And uh, so we were hungry. We'd been eating all this Chinese food for weeks, and uh, so we ordered Big Macs and we ordered shakes and we ordered fries and we ordered another Big Mac and we we ordered, and we carried trays and trays of food back with us to the table and sat down and began eating and there was a crowd 10 people deep all around us just watching and, and pointing and talking to each other they'd never seen anything like that before and uh, <laughs> it does put you in touch with uh, how rough things are in the other other parts of the world and you know how fortunate we are you know i don't want to get too uh, off in a maudlin uh, well, I, I, no, like that. I understand I, I was actually my father was a contractor for the armed forces and uh, from my, when i was five till i was 10 we were actually raised in Turkey. Oh uh, my gosh! And so I've I've spent my life traveling everywhere else, and yeah. uh, and I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, Turkey. Huh? You remember any of the language, or is that too long? Uh, ago? A little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit. My 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 son actually ended up dating a Turkish girl in high school, uh, locally, and it brought back some of the language, but uh, uh, I, of necessity. Uh, but it, but yeah, uh, you you worked uh, at. Actually, we were personal friends with the Francis Gary Powers. I remember you telling about that and uh, uh, in your article that we did. Yeah, he, he actually flew out of Interlik, uh in, Ad in Adana. And, uh, and we wow. were, my father did the refrigeration for that base. And, oh and uh, so, yeah, so I've had a, I've had a pretty interesting life <laughs> when it okay. comes to, you know. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing, you know, people people rarely understand when they're listening to music and listening to musicians how much depth and how much fascinating background there is to musicians in general i mean they're interesting people and uh it helped me it helped me when i decided to become a pilot uh i was up flying one day with a with an instructor and he was showing me what to do and i suddenly realized oh my gosh this is exactly the same multitasking I do on, on my gigs. It's no different. And, uh, and so I, I figured things out fairly quick, but it was my pleasure subsequent to that to take fellow musicians up and uh, let them take the controls. And now, do, you still have, do you still have a plane? No, I don't. That's, that got way too expensive. Um, you know, I had built a plane. I have owned a plane. Uh, I was with Rosary Grady's Flying Circus for a number of years. Uh, mostly as a passenger, uh, sure. you know, I got to fly a little bit, but not much, but, uh, yeah, I'm hoping one day here soon before I cack to get into an auto gyro and, uh, oh my. get back to flying. I I'm a big fan of auto gyros and I've, I've flown those before and I want to get back in one of those and just go fun fly. You could become the shadow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or so, you know, James Bond or something, but, uh, uh, it you know when you're flying commercially, and I I never flew jets, I, but I do milk runs out to the Bahamas from Florida, 
and things. And basically, you're just a truck driver, sure. you're just going point A to point B, and it's not much fun, and it's work. And uh, and then you still love flying, you still have a good time, but it's not fun, uh, really fun. And you can't do a barrel roll or a loop when you have passengers. They they give you a. Oh, well, you roll. can. <laughs> you can, but <laughs> maybe you won't be flying for that company anymore. But uh, so I'd like to do a little fun flying before, you know, I was telling my wife at breakfast this morning that if I was 30, 40 years younger at this point, I'd get into wingsuits, man. Those guys are crazy. And that looks like unbelievable amounts of fun. And it does. If you mess up, you're toast in, in a microsecond. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> flying's a lot of fun. There are a lot of pilots, uh, pilot musicians, Lee Floyd. Yeah. He's a long time pilot. Of course, he, he's, he's making his rounds on his boat right now. He's made a beautiful, beautiful boat to retire on. He's put a lot of money and time into it. Uh, he and I have had a lot of adventures in the air. Well, he, he, I've interviewed him. so I haven't seen that interview yet. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. And uh, we've done albums together, and uh, we've been good buddies for, well, I, I think I met him when I was out there with Don Ellis Band in 73. He was playing at Coke Corner with his dad. Yeah. And, uh, then he came to visit us at Nick Fink's in Mesa shortly thereafter, and we we got horrifically drunk together and were buddies ever <laughs> since. But uh, <laughs> anyway, this is so much fun, man. Oh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, and uh, every word I said, as far as you being one of my heroes and 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 uh, meaning so much in my career, are absolutely one hundred percent heartfelt. And I'm so glad you've agree you agreed to do this. Um, and I'm still choking away at trying to get as many musicians as I can. Uh, I started out one of the only people that I knew that I met on or off the stand. And right. it's, it's kind of snowballed because uh, sure. people are recommending friends. And have you ever, have, have you? So it's, it's a lot of fun. It doesn't mean anything financially. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> well, you know, maybe at some point it will. It's like my channel. It's, it's nothing compared to other channels and uh, it's nothing financially, but you know, I love what I do just as you love what you do and just keep doing, pursuing your passion, man. It's because it'll pay off one way or another. Well, like I say in my introduction, I think every one of these people, yourself included, have stories worthy of a movie script. And I'm just waiting for Hollywood to listen to what I'm saying because every <laughs> one of us, is. every yeah. one of us have, have in these incredible and not just musicians, everybody on the planet has as an incredible path and we should pay more attention to each other. I agree a hundred percent. And I'm finding as I grow older that I'm, I'm taking the time to do that. Uh, when we uh, spend our summers up in Bar Harbor, we have a couple of lady friends up there who are 98 and 97 respectively. And I love taking them to lunch and just asking them questions. You know, remember your first car? What oh, you mean, you mean Bahada? Yeah, the Haba. Yeah, Don Lord. If you ever knew him, he was the cornet player in the, the Rosie O'Grady's band, who's no longer with us. But yeah, he was from Bahaba. And uh, but yeah, people, if you take the time to scratch the surface, there's gold underneath. You know? Oh, that's a great sentence. Let me write that down. Uh, you'll be getting no, uh, no, 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 no rights no to that. I'm just thinking. You know. <laughs> that's, David, that's okay. thank you so much. Well, you know, don't you wish you had royalties for all the recording stuff you've done all your life? Speaking of which, not that you necessarily are interested, but I actually have another channel up that has a, record, my, a lot of my recordings that I did with 10th Avenue and Miss Behaven. And oh, I'd love it if you'd send me a link, please. First Federal Jazz Band, uh huh, which was, uh, I don't know if you, you, that band only existed for a short time, but that I was- remember uh, the name. I remember yeah. the name, but I don't. I don't know that I've heard you play. All you all, all you have to do is Daniel E. Zeilinger is my uh, is my channel name for that one. Oh, okay. Well, I can find that. All right, sir. Well, yeah. you, you take care now, and and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again sometime. That'd be great. Be I'm well, actually Dan. very very interested in your channel and that subject also. Well, it's it's fixing to go mainstream, but I'm I'm just hanging on right now. I'm the only guy on the planet doing. Uh, True stereoscopic 3D renditions of non-fractal anomalies on the surface of Mars. Gesundheit. By the way, I entered. I interviewed uh, Les Deutsch. I don't know if you know Les. I don't know Les. No. Um, he's actually uh, uh, works for JPL, uh, and he ah. does all. He does all the communications with the Mars rover. Oh my! And gosh. so you, 
you may want to check out both his interview and maybe talk to him. <laughs> Absolutely. He works, at J he works for JPL. He was also wow. part of the SETI project. Wonderful. Well, I have a lot of respect for those guys because they, they put a tremendous amount of work and genius into what they do. It's uh, they, they tend to think of people like myself as fringe lunatics. And that's okay because I don't think there's anything fringe about you, David. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, man. Be careful. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely in a, a niche within a niche on my channel. Take care, my friend. Be well. You too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz Today. Dan posts new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows, and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.